Hello, 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 and welcome to Jason at Newland, and this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. I hope that you're well, and uh, please only listen once you can safely close your eyes. Um, today's Tuesday, the 16th of April, 2024. Let me see, what is this, the speed of my internet? Okay, well. Oh, it's gone down. It's going down, it's going down. Oh, so about 30, 29, 27, 26, 25. 25 download 25 megabytes per second it should be about 40 to 50 uh, earlier on before I reset it it was about 7 megabytes a second upload is 16.77 megabytes a second my neighbor one of my neighbors downstairs asked me asked me to if they could have the password to my internet because their was it that their mobile data ran out or something and ever since then my I've started getting buffering when I'm watching things like YouTube well YouTube uh, Netflix stuff like that and the internet's going slow it's like Really? It's like that shouldn't... I mean, I think Netflix only needs 4 megabytes a second to run smoothly. So, I reset it. And I'm a little bit addicted to keep checking it now as well. Oh. The download's gone down. 20, 19, 18, 17... 16 megabytes. Plan the uploads nearly as fast as a download. So, at the weekend, I was trying to watch boxing and it just kept buffering. So, I'm going to have to have a word. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it is because it's being shared or because it's just going slow for some other reason. I don't know. But um, I might just have to change the password, which I don't really want to do because, you know, I don't want to be, I can't be bothered, to be fair. <laughs> I can't even be bothered. So, um, what's occurring, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Let's see if I've got any messages. Have I got any messages? I've just had a pizza. Just had a pizza. Pizza, 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 pizza. Pizza, 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 pizza. You know, sometimes I come onto Facebook and I just see posts from. Just, you know, posts from people, not not directed at me, but just, and I think, wow. I just, like, it's uh, quite often anti-Trump pod posts or anti-Biden posts, and... It all seems very fanatical to me, very extreme, and we're not really like that in this country. I'm not saying there's no extremism here, there is, but when it comes to politicians, um, generally, we're about, I think, lackadaisical, is it lackadaisical, whatever it's called, we're not quite so excitable about uh, you know taking sides although when Brexit happened 
a made up word but when uh, the UK had a referendum whether or not to leave the European Union it divided the country really you know that there's a lot of I've heard of people that won't that stop talking to each other because they had different views I remember I had a friend and she fell out of her son and her son was I don't know 19 probably and she was upset because he had different views to her and I said he's not your friend doesn't have to have the same views as you, the same political views as you. He's your son, not your friend. Yeah, you're not hanging out with each other. You don't have to have conversations about politics. You know, you love him. You gave birth to him. He loves you. He, I don't know, you gave birth to him. I suppose it's the same both type, both sides, but blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but he 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 thinks he's a he's a Tory and oh, I'm a Labour. Oh, I'm into Labour. He's really conservative. Like, guess yeah, so. Yeah, but I don't like his opinions on stuff. He's too right wing. But he's your son. I don't like his. You don't, you don't have to like what he thinks. As long as he's not being you know respectful to you and stuff. As long as he's not being horrible to you. You know, that's a different thing, but you don't have to talk about politics. It's not that in some people are probably thinking, well, you're talking about it. You don't have to talk about it either, but you are. Well, not really. I'm just just commenting on something that I saw on uh, Facebook. But some of the comments almost like it's really... Uh, You'd think that that uh, uh, something really extremely horrible has just been posted, and people are commenting on that. And when you look, it's just an anti, an anti president post, or an anti former president post. Well, we say former and future president post, probably. So it's weird I mean we we view in this country we view American politics um, in a way that perhaps it, it two ways uh, firstly of extreme importance to us and the world uh, from a you know from a societal financial all that stuff it's very important that we because you know we rely so much they're almost like the big brother of this country without them we would be in trouble and probably quite a few other countries would be as well potentially uh you know there was a time when we ruled the world but that was a while ago and had this country and the people running this country treated all those other countries well and with respect, then we probably would still rule the world. The silly billies, they didn't know what they had. Ah, well. So, um, there's been at least two countries handed back during my lifetime. Then there was the Falklands. Argentina decided Argentina Argentina oh my god he's talking about he's talking about conflicts and wars he doesn't normally talk about stuff like this I don't know I'm not really so how close is how close is the Falkland Islands distance to Argentina <laughs> let's have a look it's 945 miles. Okay, 945 miles to England. To England, 7,969 miles. Wow. So it's a little bit closer to 
the Falkland to uh, Argentina than us, isn't it? What if the Argentina decided uh, they found some documents saying that they used to own the Isle of Wight? We've come back to get the Isle of Wight. Huh. I didn't realise it was so far away. What the distance to the USA? It's actually closer. It's closer to America than it is to us. It's 6,758 miles. 6,700 miles. And it's nearly 8,000 miles from here. Blimey. I didn't realise that Argentina was that far away. I thought it was uh, quite close to Spain. Probably because of the football. You know, the Spanish players and... Uh, don't they speak Spanish in Argentina? Falklands... Falklands language. Spoke. Uh... English is a dialect of the English language. English is the dialect of the English language. I know that. Spoken in the Falkland Islands. This is thought it is mainly British in character as a result of the remoteness of the islands. The Falkland Islands, a cluster of 780. Now, this is something I didn't know. There's 780 different islands off the coast of Argentina. I thought it was just one island, like the Isle of Man. Has no indigenous population. Huh? How can it have no indigenous population? So the settlement history. Here we go. Let's have a little look. Uh, the Falkland Ascends needs to be stronger. Dialect uh, Okay. Okay. Settlement history. The Falkland Islands, a cluster of 780 islands off the eastern coast of Argentina, had no indigenous population when the British arrived to explore the islands in 1690. Uh, continuous settlements dates only to 1833. All right, so we were visitors. Uh, According to what England, Britain, Britain, we were the first visitors, but we obviously there's no way of knowing that, is there? Um, I'm guessing, Charles, <laughs> I'm just a guess that maybe some of those places closer would have found it before we did. Just a guess. Um, but no one apparently, according to this, settled until 1833. Wow, this is interesting. 1833, okay, okay, in 1945, the, cap the capital town of Stanley, located on East Falkland, was established. Okay, wait, a continuous settlement dates, this is Wikipedia, so I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm, we didn't have... Wikipedia in the early 80s so I didn't didn't get to find out really continuous settlement dates only to 1883 continuous settlement dates only see that is not even a proper sentence when British forces removed 26 Argentinian soldiers from the island and claimed the island for the for the British um so the 26 argentinian soldiers did argentina class it as being theirs i mean it's not like it was close oh it was close to them wasn't it sorry but it's 26 argentinian soldiers oh i wonder what happened to them i don't know i'm genuinely don't know in 1845 the capital town of stanley Located, well, there you go. Look, no other country would have a town called Stanley, only England. 
Stanley as, as a British name, as a very proper old-fashioned English name, Stanley. Brian, Stanley, Derek. So, you know, it's definitely not, you can tell it's definitely an English name. So it's located in East Falklands. Uh, Argentina also defend, Argentina also has a claim to the islands. Okay, so there was this thing that happened where um, it was a big deal in the early 90s, so early 80s, so I won't go through that. Um, ninety-nine point eight percent of islands of islanders voted to remain under British sovereignty in a referendum. I don't know when that referendum was. Two thousand twelve. Second class citizens. Okay, I don't know. Falkland Islands referendum. Falkland Islands referendum. Who were the three no votes? The Falkland Islands referendum returned an overall overwhelming yes vote. But who were the trio that voted no? This is the 12th of March 2013. So they had a referendum and they, there's only six people lived there. It's not, not a lot of people lived there, I don't think. Um, we've got islands here. Did you know that? Those that live in other countries, you might not realise, we've got lots of islands around the UK. How many islands... Around around the UK British coastline. Should say British British around hundred and eighty eight. Can you believe that? Hundred and eighty eight. But that does include part of Ireland. Okay, they're including that, so which would be Northern Ireland. So, um, so we used to own Ireland for how long did we own Ireland? How long? Hundreds of years did Britain own Ireland? Maybe "own" is not the right word. Several centuries. British rule in Ireland built upon the 12th century Anglo um, Norman invasion of Ireland on behalf of the English king and eventually spanned seven centuries, 700 years that involved British control of parts or entirety of the island of Ireland. 700 years? That's a long time. And then when did Ireland become part of the UK? Between 1801 all right, I, I'm get, this is getting too confusing. The story of Britain's rule over Ireland began in 1169 when the Normans first conquered the Island, and then on except and then on except for a brief period of independence in the 1640s, Ireland remained an integral part of the English imperial system until 1922 and the establishment of the Irish Free State. Let's delve into the historical timeline, shall we? Okay. Uh, when did it become... When did it get some freedom from us? In 1919, an Irish Republic was proclaimed by a Sinn Féin Irish Nationalist Party. Uh, facing civil war in Ireland, Britain partitioned the island in 1920. What is it about Britain that liking they enjoy partitioning things? They did it in India, didn't they? Pakistan and partitioning parts of India. They did it in 
the Middle East partitioning. They were part of the um, Palestine uh, Israel partition. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, old men with their cigars, old fat men with cigars in the you know seventy, eighty years ago, hundred years ago, sitting around making decisions without thinking of what the consequences would be. Because it didn't affect them because they were big and fat, smoking cigars, probably didn't have long to live, and they were rich and didn't have to worry about anything. So, oh, this is very political. I was making it up to go along. 1922, the Irish Free State was formed and almost immediately, oh, the North East, Northern Ireland withdrew and accepted self-governance with the United Kingdom. 1937, a new constitution renamed the nation Ire, E-I-R-E, or Ireland. And in 1949, it became a republic and left the British Commonwealth. So I've got, I've got a little stake in Ireland in the sense of my family, my dad's side of the family come from Ireland. So I am part Irish. Uh, but I did live there for a little while. Lived there for a little while. And I remember when I was there, because you know, this was in the 90s, there was still... It was, we were still getting, well, basically in London, around the country, still getting bombed by the IRA and stuff. Uh, that was still happening. This was 94 that I went to Ireland. And I was under the misconception that it was, it showed you how, how ignorant I was. And I still am ignorant, but I really didn't understand it. Uh, so I said, oh no, I said, well, we can say what we want. I was in the south of Ireland, in Carlo, County Carlo, near County Kildare, Kildare, Kildare. And um, I thought, well, just, you talk about anything, just be careful what you say in Northern Ireland. And they said, no, <laughs> it's the opposite. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the supporters the IRA wants Ireland to be one country and they want Northern Ireland to be part of Ireland. They don't want it to be one uh, separate from the UK, completely separate. They're all over Ireland, the supporters for that. Some of them are in Northern Ireland. Some of the ones that oppose that also in Northern Ireland. But the majority of the ones that, that, that want Ireland to be one place live in Ireland the 95% of the country like percentage of the land or whatever it is I don't know what percentage of land it is and I thought oh and I had that um, I, I didn't think that it would be an issue but then I dated a Northern Irish girl and she said for the first few years of living in Southern Ireland their house would get egged and painted on regularly Tell them to go back to Northern Ireland. Go back to Britain. And I think the father had a job here. I think it might be in a coal mine or some kind of job. And not here, but, you know, in, in the town. So they stuck there. And she was a kid. And when I met her, she was... I don't know how she was, early 20s probably. So she'd gone through that, but after a while people just were okay. But it took years. And I thought, that's very strange because everyone seems so friendly. Everyone seems so friendly. And then I went with Andre, not my boy, the ferret Andre, but my friend Andre. He was born in Carlo. He was Irish through and through. Um, and I I went to a nightclub with him and I went to the toilet as you do needing to do a wee wee I was just sitting there on my own and two blokes came in and they start trying to pick a fight with me and they started saying oh you English 
um, go back to England. Oh, I'll never live in England. It's a crap hole. It's really. I said, you're right. It is crap. That's why I'm living here. But because I agreed with them, they were flummoxed. They didn't know what to say. Like, they got, oh. And I just laughed and just walked out. Because if they thought they were going to like try and intimidate me, first of all, you can't intimidate me when I'm sober. You definitely can't intimidate me when I'm drinking. You know, I mean, that's, that's a, you can't intimidate anyone when you're drinking, not really. Even the, the, the mildest person generally doesn't take crap from people when they're drunk, you know? So, and it's just weird that they was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, I agree, mate. Rubbish country. I didn't think that, by the way. I kind of did a little bit. I wasn't a big fan of England at the time just because my life hadn't been going particularly well, to be honest. But I didn't I didn't really feel that way or think that Ireland was better or anything like that. But I did like Ireland. I liked being there and I knew that that's where my partly where my heritage comes from that's why ancestors uh, lived it's um, going back a bit it's my nan's parents came over the, the nan that I was really close to her parents came over from Ireland and she she didn't she was a, she was a cockney she was born in East London moved to North London during the war because East London, a lot of East London was flattened by the uh, uh, a European country that would fly over and drop things that went bang. So yeah, it was uh, a weird time. And then they started building stuff outside of London, like you know North London and into Hertfordshire and Middlesex. All kind was kind of created, sort of post-war time because people needed somewhere to live it's partly made up but I think some of it's true and then she was born a cockney then she, she'd grow up I mean she was she was I think about 17 when the war started in 1939 and my granddad was 29 so she was uh, 17 my granddad or maybe 18 maybe 16 even I don't know but she was my dad, granddad was quite a bit older than her they'd already been dating I think for a couple of years or a year or so and and my granddad had been in the in the army so he'd spent he'd spent I think 12 years in the army so so he left school, went straight into the army, served about twelve years or something, got out, got a job with the government, started date he might have been dating my nan while he was in the army, I don't know. I can't ask her, can I? And she the so the Second World War started, he went off to war. He was one of the first people called. So other than the, the actual serving uh, regiment, you know, the actual army, navy, RAF, apart from people that were actually serving, he was the first called. Uh, like the, the the previous people that had just left the army or the RAF or the, the navy. So previous people, which makes sense, doesn't it, I guess? So he was called back, and then they started constrict, constricting, constricting, constrict, whatever it is, um, forcing people to to go to war, uh, members of the public. And my granddad didn't need to be asked; he he was just ready to go. He was he wanted to go. Not wanted to go, but to defend to defend the country, he he wanted, I and mean, that's why he spent twelve years in the army. So, 
which is weird. The weird thing about it, this is a bit, a little bit more serious than not a lot of the other recordings. His, my granddad's younger brother, you see, he had to be 16 to join the army, I think. His younger brother, I'm pretty sure his name was Harry. His younger brother joined the army at 14 because he wanted to be, wanted to be, um, he wasn't, this wasn't during the, during the war, this was previous, but there was other wars like the Boer War or something, I don't know what, different wars going on around the country, around the world, India, Africa, different places. So his younger brother wanted to join the army, basically because none of them had any money, no food or anything, so he knew he'd get fed basically so he joined at 14 he faked his id and he he got blown up in a in on some mission and my nan had in a in a like a a tin thing or whatever she had both his army uh, registration forms so the date and his date of birth or maybe his badge or whatever uh, and she also had his passport no she had his no she had his birth certificate or at least a photocopy of the birth certificate uh, and had the it might have been a photocopy I don't know but of his it might be the rations card or I don't know something that he had when he was in the army when he first joined that had his date of birth and it was literally two years difference one said I don't know 1901 the other one said 1903 or something I don't know what kind of age they were Um, that wouldn't have been that bad I mean my granddad died at 18 it was in 1991 so he was born in 1911. Would that be right? Yeah. 1911. So his brother would have been born... I don't know how much younger he was than my, than my granddad. Maybe a few years, a couple of years. So he was born in 1913. So... 23, 24, 25, so be probably about 1928 he went into the army. Uh, and back then you could leave school at 14, but you couldn't join the army, I don't think, until you were 16. Now, if it was younger, he was still, he was two years younger than you could join. So, age of joining army before Second World War. Age conscription. Conscription still doesn't sound right. So in 1941, the Parliament passed a Second National Service Act. It widened the scope of conscription still further by making all unmarried women and all childless widows between the ages and 20 and 30 liable to be called up men were required were now required to do some form of national what? this you know, this required men to undertake a 6 months military training and some 240,000 registered for the service Wow. On the day Britain declared war on Germany, 3rd of September 1939, Parliament immediately passed a more wide-reaching measure. So, during the spring of 1930... Isn't that interesting? So, during the spring of 1939, before war even started, the deterioration international situation fought... So they were already preparing for war months before it even started. So they started conscripting people to join up. Wow. I do 
didn't know that. I really didn't. I thought, it, I just, yeah, I didn't know that. So in the spring, so we're talking March, April time, and the war started in September. Wow. In December 1941, Parliament passed a second uh, scope of the 20. So they made it so people up to the age of 60, you had to do some kind of form of national service, which included military service for those under 51. Wow, I'm just over that line. I'm just over that. The main reason there was not enough men volunteering for police and civilian defence work or women for the auxiliary units of the armed forces. Yeah. Now I know that, that I remember people saying that these people that refused to go, conscientious objectors, had to appear before a tribunal to argue their reasons for refusing to join up. If their cases were not dismissed, they were granted one of several categories of exemption and were given non-combatant jobs. So that makes sense. If someone's, you know, for me, my reason would be I'm a coward. And I, that should be taken seriously. Because let's face it, if you're in an army and you're, you know, you have to rely on the people that you're serving with. This like really rely on them. And I'm not reliable because I'm a coward and I will run at any opportunity. So as soon as you're honest about that, it's like, will you, will you have your your colleagues back? Will you, will, you, will you be there to help? No, I won't. I'll be running. I'm off as soon as I can. Will you help protect your... F no, no, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a coward. I told you I was a coward. It would make sense to not put that person in a war, like get them to a job they don't like, maybe outside, you know, making tea or something. I don't know. I wonder why I'm thinking about this stuff. I don't know. Huh. So Ireland, 700 years. That's quite a long time, isn't it? Even in today's standard, 700 years. And back then, you don't get... People didn't live necessarily to be really old. Some people did, but, you know, the majority... I think, you know, 40 was quite old back then. So, if you think of each century, at least two generations, maybe three generations in a century times by seven seven fourteen twenty one twenty one generations that's quite a lot it is isn't it it's quite a lot don't you think it's like me you now, I don't know much about politics. I don't know much about history. But I do know that I love you. And I know that if you love me too, what a wonderful world it would be. Uh, I don't know. It's... <laughs> I just... I find it fascinating. But at the same time... I do wonder... I have the little questions in my mind. Okay? And it's it's not... Maybe it's offensive, but I don't mean anything to be offensive. But I do wonder, right? So let's say, if we're going to look at Spain. Not Spain. We're going to look at... Mexico. Mexico. Okay. Officially, the United Mexican States, a country of the southern part of North America, covers 761,000 
610 square miles. I don't know what that means. 1,720,000 kilometers. It's the lar world's 13th largest country by area with a population of almost 130 million. The 10th most populous country and the most populous Spanish speaking country. Okay, that's my question, right? Uh, da, 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 da. Human presence in pre-Columbian Mexico dates back to 8,000 BCE. I don't know what BCE stands for. What does BCE stand for? BCE. Before the Common Era. Okay, let's answer the question. Still don't know what it means. And it's one of the world's six cradles of civilization. So here we go. Uh, de -de 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 -de. The Mesoamerican region hosted various entwined or intertwined civilizations, including the Olmec, the Maya, the Tapotec, Teolifuasecan, and Purepechan. And the Aztecs came to dominate the area prior to European contact. Okay. So we're going 8000 BC. And now we're heading all the way through to 1521. The Spanish Empire, alongside indigenous... indigenous the, in 1521, the Spanish empire alongside indigenous allies conquered the aztec empire establishing the colony of new spain in the former capital tenochtitlan now mexico city over the next three centuries so that's 300 years so 15 16 17 18 21 Spanish expansion enforced Christianity S Spanish expansion enforced Christianity spread the Spanish language and exploited rich silver deposits in Zacatecas and Juanajuato the Colum colonial era ended in the early 19th century with the Mexican War of Independence okay here we go Following independence, Mexico faced political and socio-economic upheaval. The United States' invasion during the Mexican-American War resulted in significant territorial losses in 1848. Liberal reforms introduced in the Constitution of 1857 prompted to massive... Uh, including the French intervention and establishment of an empire countered by the Republic. Oh, this is getting confusing, man. The late 19th century saw the rise of Porifirio Diaz's dictatorship sparking the Mexican Revolution in 1910, which led to profound changes, including the 1917 constitution. Subsequent governance by a succession of presidents, often former war generals, persisted until the emergence of the Institutional Revolutional Party in 1929. Uh, the 20th century saw a shift towards neoliberal policies, New, the Amer North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994. Okay. So they got their independence after how many years of being run by Spanish you think the first thing I want to do is get rid of Spanish as a language wouldn't you can you imagine let's say if you know I can't remember the country that was at war with with this country in the 40s but um, whichever country that was Sebastian might know um if they had won, like they would have taken over the country. 
and I guess expected us to speak or we would eventually be speaking German. And when we got rid of them, because we would eventually get rid of them, however long it took, we'd, they'd be out. One of the first things we'd do is get rid of the language. We'd go back to speaking English. People would be speaking English privately, even if they weren't allowed to, in public. So the language could, would keep going. And then as soon as we got it, we'd go back to speaking English. We wouldn't continue to speak the language of the oppressors. So I just don't ever understand that. Why would you keep speaking the language of a country a com- no, that invaded you? But then you could say that about this country. We've been invaded. Like, look at, oh, you don't know what it's like to be invaded. Well, that, actually, we do. Not me personally. My country, England. How many times has England been invaded? What do you reckon? So how many times, which country, okay, let's have a look, which country, country has been invaded the most throughout history? Let's have a look, shall we? Let's have a look, shall we? No, which has been invaded, not who's invaded. Is saying the British Empire, without a doubt, takes the cake for invading the most countries in history. That's not what I asked. It's not what I asked. Um, which countries invasion of uh, invasion of okay? I want to know about England. Which country has been invaded the most? Right here we go. World Atlas. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. The Mongols. <clears throat> no, because this isn't doing it, is it? It's talking about people that have done the invading. Which country has not been invaded the most? Although the exact answer is up for mass debate, there are compelling reasons to believe that India may just be the most invaded country of all. Foreigners have invaded the state over 200 times. The first person to successfully invade India was Alexandra the quite, quite good, oh no, the great, in the year 321 BCE, while the last people were the British who finally give way, give way for an um, independent India, gave way, no, they didn't do that, pronounced it wrong. So the British who finally quit. Um, Alexander the Great, the Mongols, between 1221 and 1327. They're focusing on India. I want to know about Britain. British Empire. Which countries have invaded the most? Okay, I'm going to change the question. How many times has England been invaded invasion of the British Isles Wikipedia okay invasion of England 793 to 1283 oh come on 10 times more than got more than 10 times surely A map of every country Britain has ever invaded. No, stop it. Leave my country alone. We didn't mean it horribly. Didn't mean it. They didn't know any better. They thought they were helping people. I didn't know that they were. Map of the countries Britain invaded. Countries Britain has not invaded. There's like three. Norman, which countries have invaded Britain? Oh, here we go. Which countries have invaded Britain? Invasion of the British Isles has occurred throughout history. Various sovereign states within the territorial space that constitute the British Isles has been invaded several times, including by the Romans, the German, Germanic peoples, 
Vikings, Normans, the French, the Dutch. I mean, blimey. Let's have a look. <clears throat> it's a Neolithic transition. So the arrival of the Bell Beaker to 2400 BC arrived in Britain, probably from the Lower Rhine, an architect archaeological culture characterized by a new bell-shaped pottery style and grave hoods that included copper daggers I had no idea what all around then the Celtic antiquity before the Romans came to Britain and with them the advent of written records and toilets the majority of Britain was Celtic how and when these people arrived in the British Isles is a matter of much conjecture and the 11th century Le Gabala Eren describes successive invasions and settlements of Ireland by a variety of Celtic and pre Celtic peoples. How much of it is based on historic fact is um, very much a bit of a master debater. Uh, Roman invasions. 55 BC. Celtic Britain was invaded by Romans under Julius Caesar. Caesar two invasions did not conquer Britain, but established it as a major trading partner of Rome. I thought they did conquer Britain. Okay, fair enough. A century later, a botched attempt to conquer Britain was made under the Emperor of Caligula. Um, Caligula's uncle and successor, Claudius, was the first emperor to oversee a successful invasion. See, that shows where we went wrong. So we let the Romans in, right? Because they were, they weren't invading. They were trading partners. We were trading with Rome. Come in, we do some trading, international trading, wonderful without knowing that they had little ideas like we're going to conquer this country we're going to conquer that wonderful land of Britain well anyway um, it did get taken over uh, so a botched attempt under Caligula, his uncle and successor Claudius was the first emperor to oversee a successful invasion. He used as an excuse to please for help that came from Atrobates. So they tricked us. Yeah, we need, we've been called for help, we just need help. Why have we got all those boats? I know a lot of us need help. Why have you got all those spears and swords? And why are you building the houses? Don't worry about that. What's that big arena with lions? Don't worry about that. It's fine. Blimey. So, Claudius arrived himself bringing up to 38 war elephants with him. How did he explain that one away? So when the Celts or Celts were finally defeated, the Caraticus force fl the Caraticus forced to flee to Wales, and you go okay. So the the Celts forced Wales. Blah blah blah. blah, blah. Claudius returned to Rome in the early AD sixties. A Celtic tribal queen, Boudica, led a bloody revolt against Roman rule, while the governor Gaius. Suetonius Pulinanus was pursuing a campaign on the Isle of Angelsi. Um, Boudica, angered by maltreatment at the hands of the Romans, urged her people to rise up. They did and marched on Camulondolu, now Colchester, where many former Roman soldiers had settled. The Romans in Camondunum 
were massacred after a brief fight. Meanwhile, the Ligio IX Cispana 9th Legion had been sent south from Lidun, now Lincoln, to put down the revolt. It failed to arrive in time, and when it encountered the Celts, was annihilated. The battle, however, may have enabled Governor Suentinius to arrive in Londinian, London with a small Roman army. Despite the pleas of the civil officials, Suetonius marched out of the city with his troops, knowing that any stand would be disastrous. Boudicca sacked London, sacked London and pushed on to Verulanium, now St Albans, which was also raised. Suetonius has gathered a large enough army, however, to do battle on the Roman road Watling Street. Boudicca was defeated and Roman rule was restored to Britain. Blimey. In sub-Roman Britain, the Scot of Ireland raised and colonised the Wettis of Bibibibi. German invasion. No, not that one. It's a different one. As the Roman Empire declined, its hold on Britain loosened by AD 410. Roman forces had been withdrawn and small, isolated bands of migrating Germans began to invade Britain. What? Oh, Germans. There seem to have, there seems to have been no large invasion, with a combined army or fleet, but the tribes, notably the Jutes, Angles, and Saxons, quickly established control over modern-day England. Anglo-Saxons. Sir, so they were Germans, was they? Anglo-Saxons. The peoples now called the Anglo-Saxons largely came from Jutland and northern Germany. First landing in eastern Britain. A helicopter, that's nice. There are a few seconds, there are a few records existing that account this migration, and those were written come mainly from Mediterranean areas or were created long after the event. There was a small number of Anglo-Saxons already living in Britain before the Roman withdrawal in AD 408. The majority of these served in the army and helped the Romans fight Saxon pirates who raided the southern and eastern coasts of Britain from the 3rd century onwards. Wow. Invasions of England. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are from external invasions. External. Well, what? But then, hmm. The great heathen army, then Olaf. Guffringson Eric Bloodaxe these are just different invaders Sven Forkbeard and then invader Knut that's misspelled I think Harold Havrada of Norway William the Conqueror Dane under Swinnell too Henry Beauclerc, later Henry the Second of England, and Prince Louis of France, later Louis the V one one one. He was proclaimed King Louis the First of England at Old St Paul's Cathedral, but never actually crowned. I don't know how much of this is true. It might just be made up. I mean, who'd be bored enough to put this together and? We would be bored enough to read it. Me. Wow. According to North Sagas, in 18, 1865, the
the legendary Viking chief Ragnar Lodbrok, 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 Lod, yeah, Lodbrok, fell into the hands of King Ella of Northumbria. Ella allegedly had Ragnar thrown to a snake pit. It is said that Ragnar's enraged sons, taking advantage of political instability of England, recruited the great heathen army which landed in the kingdom of East Anglia that year. It says there's no proof that this legend has any basis in history. However, it is known that several of the Viking leaders grouped their bands together to form one great army that landed in the kingdom of East Anglia to start their attempted conquest of England in 866. Blimey. So how did we come up with English? So you got Scandinavia invaders Olaf Gulliverson, Kingdom of Dublin, Norway, Denmark, Denmark, Norway. So this is these invaded list of external invasions of the oh external, huh? But what about oh seven ninety three to twelve eighty five? But what about 1283? Let's have a look. 1285. So what after 1285? See, this is very all over the place. I just want to know. Give me lists. Okay, I know where to go for this. Here we go. How long was UK Britain Britain ruled by Romans? Four hundred years. Britain was ruled by Romans for about four hundred years. Blimey. So I'm guessing we would have spoken Italian, would we not? Roman conquest began, maybe not originally, but um, we were their slaves, weren't we? So the English, British were... How many British... How many British were slaves during this time? Here we go. Estimating the number of Britons enslaved during the Roman period is challenging due to the limited and fragmented history. When the Romans invaded Britain, they enslaved many of the lo local population as a result of military conquests. These slaves were many of the local populations. Okay, these slaves were used for various purposes, such as labour in the agricultural sectors working in mines, domestic servitude and entertainment. Some were taken to other parts of the Roman Empire. However, specific numbers of even reliable estimates of how many Britons were enslaved during the Roman occupation are hard to determine. The records do not show, do not provide comprehensive data on the number of slaves and much of what is known comes from archaeological findings and occasions. Uh, can Britain, Britain can British people so so here's the answer. The idea of British people asking Italy for reparations or compensation due to historical Roman occupation of Britain is not grounded in current international law or practices. The Roman conquests occurred over a millennium ago and the notion of holding modern countries accountable for actions that took place so long ago is not typically supported by legal frameworks 
or international norms. In the contemporary world, issues of reparations generally focus on more recent historical injustices where the impacts are directly traceable and affect living populations. Well, what happened during the Romans affects where everything that happens in the past affects where we are now. Um, we could blame, yeah, I mean, reparations. I want reparations for my ancestors being slaves. Because let's face it, you can't necessarily go forward. You know, I haven't reproduced, but I can go back forever. We all can. We all go back to the first person. We basically there has to have been you keep going back there has to have been two people a mother and a mother and a father who did whoopee together to produce the baby or we could just say there has to be a mother obviously there obviously has to be a father so and then them two had to have been had father and mother and them two had to have had mother and father, them four. So we go back forever to the beginning of time, baby. Wherever, whichever country we originated from originally, whether it was Africa or India or, I don't know, the Isle of Man. By the way, the Isle of Man, I've been to the Isle of Man. I said this before, i say it again. No women there. It really is an island full of men. Five men, that's it. At least that's what it was when I went there. I think it gets busy during the TT races, I think they are. The Isle of Man races, motorbike, cross bike racing thing. But the rest of the time, and Vinny just farted, not really relevant, but oh. And that's where the window opened. I wish I had a vent in my, oh, my, oh. Proper stinky. It's like he's done a poo, but it just hasn't come out yet. Whew. Wow. Um. What was I talking about? Yeah, reparations. I want reparations. That's all I want. I want reparations. Because if you go back 50 years... Then you can go back 100 years. If you can go back 100 years, you can go back 200 years. If you can go back 200 years, you can go back 500 years. You can go back 1,000 years. So, you know, so... Who's to say? You know, I like to think that... If I've got any relatives that were wrongly accused of something, I'd like them to be pardoned. Even if it was 1,000 years ago... And that's a weird thing because I won't continue my timeline, the the family timeline. I won't continue it. And I don't think any of my brothers have had kids. So the timeline ends with us. But when you go back, there's always someone, which means there's always someone else, and there's always someone else, there's always someone else that gave birth to that person, then there's someone that gave birth to the person that gave birth to the person that gave birth to the person, then there's someone that gave birth to the person, you know, it just goes on and on and on, which means that it's pretty much right back to the, we all originate back to the first people on the planet, you can't not. Unless we were made in a laboratory somewhere. Sometimes when I look at myself, I do think maybe I was a laboratory baby, I don't know. I'm not really sure what that means, if I'm honest. Oh, 
What are you talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about today. I'm just, just, uh, I just wondered for years, why do people, all these different countries speak Spanish when they're not Spanish? You see what I mean? Like Mexican are Mexicans. They're not Spanish. They speak Spanish, but they're not Spanish. They're Mexicans. And but then you've got places in Canada who think themselves as French because they speak French. But they're Canadians. If you're born in Canada, you're a Canadian. Speaking a different language doesn't... It's like it, where you're born is what you are, you know? Especially if you if your parents were also born in Canada and their parents were born in Canada... Because at some point that ends. See, my my nan, her parents were Irish. So they were Irish their whole lives, wherever they lived. They, they could have been classed as British as well, but they were Irish. She was British because she was born in the UK. She was born in England. She was English, but... Both her parents were Irish, so you could say, well, yeah, she was Irish as well. She's like 100% Irish, because both her parents were Irish. But then she had kids with an English man. So, and they were, he was born in England. The kids were all born in England. So they weren't Irish, they were English. And I've forgotten what my point is. <laughs> I don't know what my point is. There's a point. I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah. So they're English. So I dated this girl years ago. It's the last one. Yeah. So ages. And she kept saying she was French. And she she, she could speak French. She, she spoke French. She's English as well. Spoke English. Spoke perfect English. But French was her main language. And she kept saying she was French, which implies she's from France, does it not? To me, if you say, oh, I'm German, that means that you were born in Germany. Or you're French, I was born in France. You're English, you were born in England. Doesn't mean you live in England now, but... And of course, you can be British. You can be anywhere. You can come from anywhere in the world and be called British. But English is, it's still, you know, you have to be born here for that. And so it's very strange. She she said to, oh yeah, I'm I'm French. I took a word for it. Turns out she's born in Africa, but she's born in a French colony, colony that speaks French, colonized by France who basically took advantage of people in the country, I guess, which most colonists, I don't think they treated people particularly well, if I, if I remember correctly. So she wasn't French, she, she spoke French, but she wasn't French. She thought she was French because she spoke French. So... It's kind of, it's no different really. If you get two French teachers, both born in the UK, both English, born in England, or both born in Scotland, live in Scotland their whole lives, both Scottish, and they bring a child up, and for the very first few years of that child's life, all that child hears is French, because they're both French teachers, they speak it fluently, and they teach that child, bring bring that child up, homeschooled as well, French. All the way through childhood. And then they get to the age of 16, 17, ready to go out in the world and get a job. Maybe meeting people for the first time. Is that kid French? Just because they speak French. Or the 
what about the fact that they've had both the parents of, live in Scotland, born in Scotland, maybe both have Scottish parents, Scottish grandparents, Scottish, Scottish great grandparents, whatever. So the whole lineage is from Scotland. But they both teach the kid to learn, you know, just bring the kid up on, doesn't even tell the kid it's French. Just, that's just how it learns. Just from listening, just from watching, observing. Is that kid then French? So, yeah, see, I find it interesting. So I don't really know the history of um, of Canada and the whole French thing. I don't really know how that came about, to be honest with you. Uh, why does parts <laughs> parts of if I put in Canada, okay, it's going to fill us rest in. Why does parts of Canada... Why does parts of Canada... Okay, I'm going to Google this. I bet you it fills it in. Why does parts of Canada... Canada... Celebrate Thanksgiving? Okay, if I put an S... Shut down, sell, ship to Canada, split, start, stop, drop, ship to Hawaii, save, sink, sell ice cream. Okay, if I put P, split, I thought it was speak, split, speak, spread, sports, space, spoil, spend, speech, spring, spray, Sp speak. Why does... Oh, I'll put Marts instead of Parts. That's probably why. Why does Parts of Canada... It, I bet it comes up now. Speak French. Here we go. French is spoken in parts of Canada due to the historic influence of French colonisation and the preservation of the French language and culture in certain regions of Canada. French settlement in Canada began 16th century and even though the British gained control over the country, French culture and language persisted. These communities have their own accents and dialects of French, combining different elements from other regional languages and folk dialects that were spoken in France at the time of colonisation. 16th century... So I just, I do, again, I kind of wonder why, but then if, if you think about it, okay, they were colonised, but then if you're born and you're raised to speak French, for example, even though you're not in France, clearly, and you're a long, long way away from France, and you're in a... Uh, in Canada, near America, then, well, it depends what part of Canada, because Canada's huge, isn't it? Uh, so, and you're born into a, a French-speaking family, and then us old British the heroes come along and free you from the... <laughs> We, what did we do? What did they say? Even though the British gained control over the country, the people that were thought of themselves as French wanted to continue. Which, to be fair, should be their right, shouldn't it? I mean, if I... I'm just thinking, I speak English. Now, if... If, for example, um, the people in this country decide we're going to get rid of that and we're going to go back to speaking Dutch or we're going to go back to speaking Italian like we used to when the Romans were here or we're going to go back speaking Norwegian like we did when the Norways, the, the, um, 
the Vikings were here or whatever, you know, so and let's face it, the Romans were here for 700 years, no, 400 years, sorry, it's pretty likely that a heck of a lot of people spoke Italian or Roman, whatever their language was back then. So I'm guessing if you were born into that, Imagine your your father, your great, or your mother, your great auntie, your great grandmother, her great grandmother, even all spoke Italian, and you speak Italian, and then suddenly they're gone. You know, the Romans move out overnight. Bye bye. Nice knowing you. See ya. Um. You, you kind of like you, I guess you wouldn't know what to do would you all you've ever known is speaking the language you're speaking oh, it's very confusing makes me wanna eat some ice cream ice cream ice cream ooh ooh Makes me wanna eat some sponge cake, sponge cake, and ice cream, mm -mm -mm. ice cream. But then I realized I got no ice cream, no ice cream left. So what I might do is have sponge instead. Oh, this has been a weird, weird one. I don't know. I'll talk about nothing, but talk about some real stuff as well. It's probably not. I don't know if this was uh, I don't normally talk about this stuff I don't know why I did today I do find I do I find it interesting sometimes you know history and how do we get to where we are now and I look at how things are changing in the world and how things are going to move to a different place and I uh, just find it fascinating Right. I might have some ice cream in the fridge in the fridge freezer I mean I might I don't know I've got this little idea little bell's gone in my head thing saying have a little check you never know there might be some ice cream in there and if there is wow I will be excited excited isn't the word actually it is the word it's the correct word I don't know why but you know you know what I mean so I'm going to go thank you very much for listening all this information is stuff I've got off the internet, so none of it is known. I don't know anything about history. Well, I know a little bit, not much. <sighs> I thoroughly enjoyed watching Vikings, the television show. Absolutely loved that show. But anyway, remember, remember to be kind to yourself because you do deserve to be happy. Be gentle with yourself. Lots of love. Bye. Bye, bye, bye.